Welcome to Deer Talk Now. I'm Brad Rooks with my co-host Brian Lovett. Dan Schmidt has left the building. It's peak of the rut. Dan's in Wyoming. He's going to return shortly. He's going to give us a call in. Shot a great big buck. I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'm not going to say much about it. Um, but it, like I said, the rut is in the peak. We're up here in the Midwest. There's every place in the world I want to be in the woods, but here I sit at this desk to bring you the show live. <laughs> <clears throat> A couple deals that we got going on. I want to mention a few things from the shop deer store. We have, uh, Dan had mentioned a Terra Lux flashlight before. It's got a thousand loom light. It's a great flashlight. It's expensive. It's like 200 bucks, but he swears by the thing. It's rechargeable. Be sure to check out the website. There it is. It's a great, great product. Uh, I think you'll absolutely love it. I know Dan was wild about it. He actually has used it on his first hunt in Buffalo County. The outfitter was highly impressed. Oh, and I bet you this and is Dan, Dan Schmidt. This has to be Dan the Killer Schmidt. Hey, how's it going? Good. How about yourself, Dan? Awesome. The, the rut is going on here in Wyoming. <laughs> well, tell us about the hunt. Well, it's fantastic. You know, I, I flew out here Sunday, as you guys know, and, you know, Charlie nailed it with his rut predictions this year uh, in the calendar, I, I think. I mean... When we laughed and when we were all talking about it before we left, there was just a little bit of chasing starting. We got here Sunday, and it was the same kind of thing, but it just kind of exploded. First day, I mean, there was big bucks chasing does everywhere. And, uh, you know, we're right at the – we're right we're in the Black Hills, but it's the very western edge of the Black Hills. And uh, what's so cool about that is you have, you have mule deer, you have elk, you have whitetails. You have Miriam's turkeys, Brian. It is really cool that you could see all these different animals. But, you know, these bucks were moving, and what they said is we're going to spot and stalk in the mornings, which we did, and we saw some nice deer. But, we, you know, you're four or five. It's so different than hunting at home, four or five, 600 yards away from these deer. So they said what we're going to do is we're going to sit in uh, box blinds midday, which is kind of was kind of interesting for me. They dropped me off at 1030, and... Uh, I look up just shortly after noon. I had been texting with Brian back and forth just to see how things were going, and I look up, and there's this giant 150-class 10-pointer making a scrape right in front of me, you know, 140 yards across uh, this, well, I don't want to call it a field. It was a grassy, grassy area. And he was, I shot him right as he, as he was making a scrape. I, it was really, really cool. Mm, nice. Mm. How, how are the rest of the guys doing in camp? Anybody else harvesting uh, here? We all tagged out. It, it's been uh, we've had ten hunters in camp, uh, and what's what's really neat about it, you know, it's it's rifle hunting here during the rut. So you know, you're shooting two seventies, you're shooting thirty out sixes, but um, within two days, everybody saw a good buck. You know, 140 inches or better, um, chasing does, working scrapes. It's been kind of dry, so they've been coming to some water uh, tanks that are out in this cattle country. And uh, we, so we went uh, 10 for 10 wow. on some really nice bucks. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really cool because it's western whitetails. You got them intermingling with those big muleys. And uh, we, there's no crosses, though. That's, I found that interesting. There's no, you, sometimes you see those species intermingle and you'll see interbreeding, but we, they, they don't have too much of that here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's either one side of the canyon is all whitetails or one side of the canyon is all muleys. And, um, a lot of nice uh, typical genetics. A lot of a lot of nice five by fives. Some big four by fours, and uh, one guy shot one ahead of drop time, which was pretty cool. Nice. Who's was your deer the biggest one, or is it right up there with him? Uh, I'd say it was right up there with him. Really? Uh, he's really wide. I didn't put a tape to him or anything. I'd say he's probably twenty inches wide. Um, probably the biggest, if not one of the you know top two or three that oh. was shot. But everybody you know shot a really nice buck. Um, we're hunting with uh, with Ralph Dampman and Trophy Ridge Outfitters. It's uh, it really if everybody wants to see photos of some of these deer, go to TrophyRidgeOutfitters.com. Uh, just an awesome place. Really nice deer. Great camp. Three hundred thousand acres he has, which blows my mind. You know, we we back home we talk in terms of forty acres and fifty acres. He's got three hundred thousand acres that he leases. Wow. Uh, just for just for hunting. No, so it's a it's a pretty different uh, experience. What's, what's the property like that you're on, Dan? You mentioned some canyons and, I mean, a lot of uh, Pine Ridge and stuff like that. Exactly. Uh, what's interesting about that, Brian, is it's, uh, and you've, you've, you've hunted the Black Hills, so you know this, it's a lot of that Ponderosa Pine, 
and it's you know it's canyons and ridges. Uh, you know, I call them ridges. They're kind of like almost like draws. But then when you get farther west, you get into some of that uh, prairie uh, area and and some of that flatter country. And you wouldn't think a whitetail would be there, but there there are whitetails there, and they're just out in in sage and and stuff like that. But um, it's a very uh, we're just I shot my buck in the shadow of uh, Devil's Tower, Sweet. so it's uh, you know some really cool uh, terrain there, some uh, rock outcroppings that you don't see just anywhere. Um, it's this kind of part of the Wyoming that where you see that, and even if you get into South Dakota, you're going to see that as well. Dan, I know you're with Kevin Howard on an industry hunt, you know, but you're shooting a new Browning, correct? How'd you like yeah, that thing? Yeah, Browning X Bolt, um, and not six, and and we were shooting those uh, uh, Winchester ballistic tips. That's the first time I've shot a ballistic tip in a whitetail, if you can believe that. And uh, you talk about incredible bullet performance. I mean, it's that thing, and in that, and in, you, as you know, that bullet is designed to dump all that energy into the whitetail, and that's exactly what it did. Uh, that deer basically, I mean, when I shot, the guns are so incredibly accurate. I mean, I felt confident with that thing way out to 300 yards, which come, being a Midwestern, you know, upper Midwestern hunter that we're not normally used to shooting like that. But um, all perfect bullet performance. Uh, we had the uh, Bushnell uh, Legend scopes on there, so we had the multi-reticle scope. So we, we would have been good out to, mine was 145 yards, I think. Uh, we would have been way good out to 300, no problem. Uh, just really uh, good performance on that that gear. Wow. Well, congrats. We're going to let you go because uh, Don Higgins is going to be call, calling in shortly. So congrats. When are you back in the office? I'll be back. Uh, I'm flying home tomorrow morning, and I'll be back in the office on Friday. So I'll have – we don't have self, really good cell service. I can text but can't send photos. Everybody wants to see more photos. I'll have photos up on, on the deer and deer hunting site uh, Friday morning. All right. Sounds good. See you then. All right. Have a good show, guys. Yep. Congratulations, Bye. Dan. Thanks, man. What a great deer. Man, he's, he's had a horseshoe up his butt, i got to be honest with you, for the last year, two years. I mean, he's been killing deer yeah. wherever he goes. I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, that is a beautiful deer, and it sounds like a cool hunt, too, in that western terrain. I mean, uh, you've been out in, in those areas like that, and uh, it's just a totally different experience from growing up here in the Midwest and hunting little wood lots and agricultural fields and things like that. A so. Absolutely. You know, it, it is fun when he told me about that hunt. I was hoping we were going to film it for Destination Whitetail, which is on tonight. Um, but for whatever reason, we didn't have a chance. The cameraman wasn't along with him, but it would have been a great slam dunk, you know, experience there. Before Don calls in, I'm going to plug a few other things uh, that we're doing in the shop deer store. Uh, the can cookers right here. I mean, can cooker, we only have 24 of these babies left, to be honest with you. Wow. If you order now, you get the free grate in the middle. If you're not familiar with it, with it, it's a pressure cooker. Basically, you know, you unsnap the top, you can load up all your food, you put the vegetables in, the last thing you put in is your meat, put it on any kind of heat source, either your gas grill, your stove inside, open fire, doesn't really matter. Within an hour, that food's going to be done. You pour it out. Um, it is a great little little product. I saw it at the ATA uh, a couple of years ago, which is the Archery Trade Show. And whoop, this could be Don. Boy, we're not even have to talk today. This is great. <laughs> Hello, is this Don? This is Don. Hey, Don, this is Brad. How's it going, Brad? Good. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Hey, I didn't get a chance to really give you a great uh, introduction to the show. Do you want to tell the folks exactly a little bit about your, you know, who you are and, and what makes you popular, other than just killing all the big whitetails that we know about? Well, I guess to start with, I'm an outdoor writer. I've been writing uh, for a variety of magazines since the mid-1990s. I've authored a couple of books. In fact, my second book just came out about a week ago. And uh, I do some habitat consultations, travel around the Midwest doing that, and also own a, a tree nursery where we grow a lot of the trees that we use on these conservation projects. So you can see I've got my hand in a lot of different things. Yeah, and, and, and I've been a fan of your writing for many years. You know, your, your real specialty, I would say, is habitat management and being able to manipulate you know, your own land into a format that's much more huntable than what it currently is, or to be able to generate more mature bucks than what your capacity was in the past. And, you know, that stuff, according to me, you know, it's right up my, my alley. I love this stuff. I love being able to do that. And that's what makes whitetail hunting so much fun. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, the habitat work's actually kind of become a passion of mine that I enjoy as much as the deer hunting itself. 
So uh, I was fortunate and blessed, you know, really to to be able to turn that into a career and it became so successful. My wife was even able to quit her job and help me. So, wow, uh, you know, it's a dream come true. Outstanding. Mm. Hey, Don, it's Brian Lovett. Um, Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Good. Uh, just wanted to ask you, how long have you been uh, into habitat management? I mean, did it kind of uh, start with the modern trend, or had you been doing a lot of it, you know, owning a nursery for, for years before that? Well, I, I actually just kind of fell into it. Uh, I had a, I bought my grandparents' farm when they passed away. It's just a small farm, and we'd raised beef cattle at the time, and I had an opportunity to sign up some of the acreage for a CRP, and, uh, you know, I could make more money doing that than I could raising the cattle. And it just made perfect sense. And, you know, I was already an addicted whitetail hunter anyway, so I decided to take that cattle farm and turn it into the deer habitat. Now, how many years, you know, grew from there. Yeah, you know, having a cattle farm, and, you know, if, if people are not familiar with that, you know, I'm sure you're running beef cattle in the pasture, and those things eat basically everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just, it, it's vacant know. of all the shrubs, <laughs> vacant of anything. How right. long did it take you to get that property back into, you know, good quality deer habitat? Yeah, it was actually a pretty quick process. And when I started, I'm not in an area that has a whole lot of deer. I'm kind of out in an agricultural prairie. And uh, I, I thought when I started, you know, if, if I could get to the point where on, on a hunt I might see five or six deer occasionally, that that'd really be something. And... Uh, you know, I've got to the point where now in the winter time I'll have 50 or more deer wintering on my property, and I've had a number of hunts where I've seen more than 10 different bucks on a hunt, and I think the most I've ever seen here is 17 different bucks on one hunt. But uh, it, it actually happened pretty quick. Uh, you know, once uh, we got the cattle off of the place, I would say within two or three years, the deer had pretty much uh, found a, a home, and then they just kind of multiplied from there. And, and each year it just became better and better than it was the year before. Now at the same time you were doing that, were you also uh, starting to practice like selective harvest, uh, selecting more mature bucks instead of passing up younger deer? Well, you know, I've always wanted to be a trophy hunter for since I was a kid, actually it started. And I killed my first buck when I was 16 back in 1979. And, uh, you know, I was a trophy hunter basically from the word go because after I killed that first buck, well, I wanted my second one to be bigger. And I think one of the things that that made me so successful in the end was that I wasn't willing to sacrifice my goal towards the end of the season, you know, if a lesser buck came along, I'd hold on to that tag, you know, and eat tag soup that winter rather than uh, shoot a buck that wasn't up to my standards. And that really just gave me a lot more time in the field. And, you know, it just... Uh, the experience just added up over the years and made me a lot better hunter. Yeah, it, it's interesting there, uh, you know, because I was the same way. I mean, it used to kill me to have a tag in my pocket, and now I'd rather kill a big deer or or, or eat that tag. I mean, there's plenty of antlerless deer out there in the world for me to harvest, and and I'm going to do my share on that. And if I don't get a mature whitetail, I don't get a mature whitetail. I, I can live with not shooting a big buck, mm -hmm. but it's hard. Let's talk a minute about your book, Don. You sent it. I did not literally. I, I stole this off of Dan Schmidt's desk. Uh, I know this one was mine because it's signed. I want to thank you for it. You know, identifiable names. You got Mark Anthony, Adam Hayes, Roger Raythor, the Wenzel brothers, uh, Bobby Worthington. Give us a little premise as to what made you think about doing this book and what it's about. Well, I published my first book back in 2005. And uh, when we did that, my wife and I talked it over and we weren't even sure, you know, this was going to be profitable or anything. And we, we finally decided to go for it, and uh, we figured after that, we printed 2,500 books, and we figured we had to sell the first 500 to pay for the printing. Well, we sold the first 2,500 in no time and had to do a second printing. And uh, it just seemed that a lot of people related to it because, you know, I wasn't trying to make myself out as an expert or, or anything. I was just relating what I seen in the woods. And shortly after that book came out, I was getting requests for a second book, and people wanting to know when the second book was coming out. But I never really felt like I had enough information to justify a, a second book. And it's kind of like with my magazine articles. I, I feel like if I don't have something important to say or a, a different angle on a topic, then I just don't want to put an article out to be putting articles out. Yeah. 
So I, I didn't really have enough material on my own for a second book, but I knew enough guys that uh, were very successful and also very ethical that had plenty to say, and I just came up with the idea, you know, why not let each guy write two or three chapters and compile them together in one book? And that's what I did, but, you know, there was a, there's a lot of people that I could have chose from to be in the book, that, and justifiably so, that are, are very knowledgeable about whitetail hunting, but I went a little bit farther, and I made, it, made sure that the guys that I selected we're also very ethical and, and good uh, ambassadors for the sport of deer hunting. And that, that surely doesn't mean that they're the only ones that are, but they're ones that I knew on a personal level that uh, I could approach about the book. And so I guess that's how it came to be. It, it, it's a great looking book. And before, you know, how this works is we got a pile of questions. <laughs> I mean, a pile <laughs> yes, of we questions. Do. We're never going to get through them all. But there's one other product that I know you're involved with and I want to give you a chance to talk about a little bit. And that's your real world wildlife seed. Um, you know, uh, before when you were first coming out with it, I'd read about it already uh, over the internet because it's kind of funny how some of this stuff just takes off. The, the one that I was really interested in was your wildlife soybeans because, you know, I think the people that are going after the grays, the big leafy soybeans, uh -huh. are, are, are chasing the wrong thing. I mean, I plant regular agricultural soybeans and, and I always have enough foliage. You know what I mean? I always have enough foliage. I don't have to worry about big leafy leaves. So, uh, Well, the way the whole seed company came about was through my habitat work. I've always desired to have the very best habitat possible. I mean, everything I do related to deer hunting, I, I do it the best I possibly can. I mean, I want to have the best bow in my hand. I want to have, you know, the best property, the best, you name it. All my equipment's the best, trail cameras, right on down the line. And I want my food pots to be top of the line. And I was working with a video group producing videos, and it kind of came to me, hey, on our next video, what we ought to do is contact all these food plot seed companies and get them all to donate, you know, a bag of their seed, and we'll plant it all side by side by side in a checkerboard-like pattern in a field, and we'll just let the deer tell us which is the best. We'll video over it as we hunt over it, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll incorporate that as part of the hunting video. And at the same time, you know, we're educating the viewer, but we're also educating ourselves so that we can have the best food plot seed on our, our properties. So we started contacting these companies, and what we found was they were all willing to, to send us free seed, but nobody would send us free seed if we was going to plant it next to a competitor's. Yeah. And kind of a light bulb went off, you know, like, you know, if, if they're confident in their product, they ought to be able to put it right next to the competitor. And you mentioned soybeans, and soybeans are by far my favorite food plot. Me too. And but but one uh, you know one problem I'd always had with soybeans is a lot of times in the late season those pods will shatter open and drop the soybeans onto the ground. And for years I'd just been getting soybean seed from my neighbors who are farmers, and putting that in my plots. And some years it worked fine, but a lot of years the seeds would would uh, shatter and drop the beans onto the ground in the mud or snow or whatever. So what we did when we started the, the whole food plot seed company was we got our hands on every variety of soybeans we possibly could and tested them side by side by side. And we just observed them for shatter, but we was doing our observations in March, you know, after those beans had stood for the entire winter. There's a lot of ag soybeans that are tested for shatter resistance, you know, because uh, it's important for the farmer to be able to harvest that crop. And, and if they're shattered and laying on the ground, they can't. So. You know, it, it's uh, of interest to farmers as well, but the thing of it is those agriculture beans are tested for shatter resistance in the fall. And as deer hunters, we need those beans to be in the pod during the winter. So we tested every variety we could get our hands on, and the three that we found that had the best shatter resistance, we uh, incorporated into a blend, and that's how we came about. That was our first product, actually, that uh, we ever released. And it's just kind of grown from there. Yeah, it, it's a great idea. Those, if you haven't had, you know, planted beans in the past, it's a great food source early in the season. And then when the leaves defoliate, you know, the, the deer kind of leave them alone for a while. But man, at uh -huh. the end of December, you can't get better in standing soybeans. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you. And you know, I mentioned earlier that I had a hunt where I'd seen 17 different bucks on the same hunt. Actually, all 17 of those bucks were standing in a soybean food plot at the same time. 
Yeah. And it was during a brutal spell in uh, early January. Yeah, absolutely. And it's high in protein. I mean, that's the other thing. It's a great food source for those whitetails. Right. A, lot of, a lot of people have corn and it's carbohydrates. And yeah, it's going to keep that deer alive. But it's really not doing anything to build up their body or muscle mass. So yeah, I mean, exactly. It's a, it's a lot better to go on. So let's let's start off with some questions. I'm going to let Brian Lovett ask the first one, and then we're going to give you a rapid fire through here. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. All right, Don. This one is from Scott Fazbender in Wisconsin, and Scott asks, "What's the biggest difference you see when hunting mature, four and a half year old plus whitetails compared to younger bucks?" Well. Probably the first thing is there's a whole lot less of them. Uh, for every four and a half year old buck, you know, there's probably three times as many three and a half year olds. And then you can just go right on down the line and, and they're just such a rare animal to begin with in most places, uh, you know, unless you've got a large private property that's, you know, tightly controlled. So that's the first thing is just having a four and a half year old buck around to be able to hunt him. And then the other thing is, uh, how they use the wind. I mean, if uh, a big buck just won't move hardly unless he's got the wind at his advantage. And, and if you don't understand how to play the wind, then you're not going to get a crack at him. So I think uh, just having one around to begin with and then how that buck relates to the wind is probably the other big difference. Yeah, I would agree. Hey, we got a question kind of on that same uh, front. It was from Andy Phelps, and he has said, uh, his, you know, it's long. He said he hunts out of basically public land. But his biggest uh, problem is how does he locate uh, where the big buck is to harvest them? So how, how do you go about in finding you know the mature whitetails on your property, I guess is what he's asking. Well, you know, I, I hunt a lot more than just my own property. I, I've got a lot of places I hunt just simply by knocking on doors and asking permission. So I can relate to this question real well. And, and you know, like right now, I've probably got permission for eight or ten properties, but I'm not hunting them all because some of them don't have big bucks on them. And the best way I've found to, to locate big bucks is with a trail camera. Yeah. And this time of the year, you know, just go out and, and find a scrape that's being hit hard and put a camera on it, and you'll get a picture of every buck in that area. Now, yeah. once the rut heats up, you know, and the, the bigger bucks are with the does, it, it's kind of tougher. But, you know, if you start in October and find a good scrape or make a good mock scrape and put a trail camera on it, it won't take long until you'll have a, a picture of every buck in the area. I 100% agree. I'm huge on mock scrapes. My favorite time is in October. Yep. And I can even relate to uh, not having a mature buck on your property. That is, in my case, my personal farm this year. I do not have a buck that's on there that I want to kill. So it's kind of funny how that all worked out. But yep. it's a case of life. All right, Don. Uh, this question is from Brian Thurm in Iowa. Brian asks, is it true the bigger the tree, the bigger the buck that is rubbing the tree? He would think that any size buck could rub a larger tree. What's your experience? <coughs> well, in my experience, a big buck will rub all sizes of trees, big and little, but a small buck will generally pick on smaller trees. If you've got a tree six inches in diameter or bigger, you can just about bet that's a big buck. So you don't see too many forkhorns rubbing on trees six inches and bigger. So, you know, a big rub is one thing that really gets me excited, and uh, the bigger the better. Especially, you know, little bucks may hit that rub once it's open, to, right. to, to, in my experience, but to open that big rub, normally have a, a you know, mature whitetail. And yeah, I can I say... I 100% of that. Yeah. And on my farm, again, case in point, I have no big <laughs> rubs this year. <laughs> so, there you go. Yep. Uh, this question is from uh, Brian... Emmonson out of Wisconsin. He says, uh, thank you for taking time to talk to Deer Talk Now. He has two questions. He says his time is extremely limited to be out in the woods. What are one or two things you would say to someone like me to help me stay in the game of shooting the best deer I can? And his second question is, when talking to people, what are the one or two biggest mistakes you see people making when hunting big deer? Well, as far as timing, if you're limited on time, say a guy's only got... Uh one week of vacation a year you know i've been preaching for a long time that uh from uh, november 5th to the 12th is probably the best seven day period there is which we're right in the middle of right now actually and uh, another good point or time is right around thanksgiving weekend i found that uh, you know towards the end of the rut around thanksgiving when the the hot does are becoming more and more scarce 
you know, big bucks on his feet a whole lot more looking for the last one or the next one. And there was a string of like five years in a row where the biggest buck I seen from a tree stand during each of those five years was during Thanksgiving weekend. And every one of those bucks was on his feet looking for a doe, not with a doe, but he was on his feet searching. So there's something about that, that period right there at the end of November that if you, you know, a lot of people are off work uh, Thanksgiving weekend, so if you're pressed for time or can't get time off from your job, you know, don't give up just because you think you know, the, the peak of the rut's over. That, that's a prime time. And if you've only got one week of vacation to take, consider getting as many days as possible between the 5th and the 12th. And the second question was the mistakes people make on yeah. mature bucks, is that right? Yes, correct. Two of the biggest mistakes. Well, as I alluded to earlier, not uh, learning how mature bucks use the wind as they travel. Uh, you know, the wind is key. If, if you're just going out there and looking for sign and throwing up your stand over the sign, uh, you're not going to kill a whole lot of mature bucks. You need to understand, you, you need to have a a total plan in place or an idea of where that buck's at right now, where he's going to be going, and how he's going to utilize the wind to get from point A to point B. And when you throw all those things together and come up with an educated plan, then you can start doing it consistently. And part of the other mistake people make is they're not hunting where the mature bucks are spending their daylight hours. They're hunting sign instead. Yeah. After the sun goes down, you know, a buck can cover miles leaving tracks and scrapes and trail cam photos and rubs and whatever but uh, when the sun comes up he's got a safe place where he likes to be and that's where he's at and if if that's not on your property your odds of killing him have went down considerably yeah what what time you know i know you tagged out this year early in the season do you like that early season as well you know it for for taking a mature white tail well you know the buck i shot this year on october 5th was the earliest i've ever shot a good buck and it can be a good time. My favorite time is the late season because if you can get the, a good food source like a field of standing soybeans, you can draw deer from a long ways off, and the worse the weather, the better it gets yeah. because it'll get them bucks on their feet you know, every afternoon and head to that food, and they're real predictable. You know, During the rut, a friend of mine once said that uh, you can kill a buck from any tree in the woods if you're there on the right day. And, but during the, the late season, you can do it on purpose. You can, you know, come up with a plan and execute it year after year after year. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, early season is great if you have a big one and he's patternable on a food source. But other than that, uh, that late season, you know they're going to be on your feet and hitting the food source. So if you have right. the food, they're going to come. Mm -hmm. All right, Don, got a great habitat question here from uh, L.B. Miller in Illinois. And Alvy says, uh, please talk about the role warm season native grasses play in the attempt to hold deer on your property versus deer going on your neighbor's property. Well, I, you know, I'm real big on native grasses. And in fact, uh, Real World Wildlife Seed Company has a special blend called Bedding in a Bag that we've created just for whitetail bedding cover. One of the best things about them is you can establish bedding cover, you know, within a, two years. It's not like planting trees or, or brush or something where you've got to wait several years for it to, to get big enough to hide deer. These native grasses, a lot of times the first year you plant it, by fall, you know, you've got enough cover you can hold bedded deer. And what I found on my property is that deer actually prefer to bed in those grasses than they do wooded cover. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's more comfortable for them or they just feel more secure in there because it's so dense and everything or what. But... Uh, you know, the first time I ever planted native grasses, I planted a five-acre patch. And the very first evening that I hunted over it that fall, I watched five bucks walk out of it. And so I was convinced from day one, and I've just been planting more and more. And, and there's something to that. They, they love to bed in that grass. Uh, I agree. You know, it, it can be a learning experience because, you know, when that craze kind of took over, I'll go back 10 years, you know, I was going to jump on the wagon, and only I didn't do my research well enough. And, you know, I planted all the big blue stem, the stuff that's, you know, eight foot tall or whatever it gets. Uh -huh. and, it, and that winter, it all crumpled. I'm like, what the world? What did I do wrong? You know, and then somebody informed me you should, you know, have several different blends in that, correct? And that's what I'm sure your bedding in a bag does. It has the two foot stuff that holds up the four, the four that holds up the six, and so on. And that's what really makes it more of a viable bedding area. Is that correct, Don, or not? 
Well, the thing of it is, there's uh, like each species has several varieties within the species. For instance, switchgrass. You know, there's there's probably a, at least a dozen varieties of switchgrass. And same way as big blue stem and Indian grass, there's there's numerous varieties of each of those. And what we did was we tested each, every variety that we could get our hands on, and we tested them for standability in the winter, so that when they encounter snow and wind and ice and things like that. We want the ones that are going to stand or at least spring back up. And uh, that's pretty much tied to variety as much as anything. So our blend includes uh, Indian grass, big blue stem, and switchgrass, but it's the specific varieties in the blend that sets it apart from others. Okay. Interesting. Hey, th this one's a, kind of a, on that same uh, format for a question. It's from uh, Dwayne Hopkins out of Illinois. Says Don, you emphasize the importance of the sanctuary and what you can use to create one. What size of area do you need to do this, and how long does it take to establish one, one of these areas? I like for a sanctuary to be as big as, as practical on a property. In fact, uh, on my property, it's 120 acres. Every one of my stands is within 20 yards of the edge of the cover. The heart of the property I leave to the deer. It's basically their sanctuary. And when I walk across an open field and right into the cover, my scent is always blowing out, you know, across the open field. So those deer, if they do encounter me, it's around the edge of the property. And they don't, you know, they don't ever smell me because my scent's never blowing in, at least while I'm hunting. Now, if I'm out working, that's a different story. But, uh, you know, a sanctuary is the key. Like I was, you know, the other question, what's the biggest mistake people make? is not having hunting on a property where a mature buck spends his daylight hours where well, you can make those deer stay on your property by just giving them security and security more than anything means freedom of human intrusion mm -hmm. you know we've all seen state parks and things like that that are just absolutely loaded with deer that nothing special has been done to the habitat and it's the freedom of human intrusion that makes that property special to the deer yeah. you know in, in their eyes anyway so, you know, on a sanctuary, I like for them to be as big as possible, but at the same time, I, was, I like for them to be as thick as possible, too, because mature bucks especially like thick cover to bed in. So if you can combine the two, a large area free of human intrusion, and then make it as thick as possible, you're going to have some mature deer on your property if there's any in the area. Uh, I agree. There's a couple other things that you can do if you can get a water source within that, that sanctuary. I mean, the, now you got another one of the prerequisites in there. Right. Um, and even... One of the food plots we plant is basically inside my saying We never hunt it. We just leave it for the deer so they feel totally safe. Uh -huh. we, we put a camera on it, but we don't really check that camera until after the season's over. So, All right. All right, uh, Don, here's a hot-button question from uh, Tim Walmsley in Illinois. Uh-oh. And uh, <laughs> he's asking, how do you feel the current uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources Wildlife Division has done with the state's deer management when it comes to having mature whitetail bucks in the herd, as compared to, say, 20 years ago under the then Illinois Department of Conservation? Well, I think the, the current DNR, and actually going back for a few years, has made it very clear they don't care at all about the mature deer. In fact, uh, for a number of years, I was a director for the Illinois Bow Hunter Society and, and was privileged to to sit in meetings with DNR personnel and meet with legislature, legislators and things like that and actually even testify in, in front of uh, legislators and, and various committees. Ironically, uh, I testified in one where Barack Obama, state senator at the time, was part of the committee that we te I testified in front of. But to get back to the question, Illinois DNR does not care about mature deer. In fact, I said in a meeting where John Buner Kempe from the DNR came and visited with the Illinois Bowhunter Society Board of Directors in Decatur, Illinois, and John said specifically that the Illinois DNR looks at uh, the deer herd as a number. You know, at the, at the end of the summer, there's X number of deer in the herd, and they want to have that number down to X number or Y number at the end of the year. And he specifically said they don't care which deer in the herd are killed or how they're killed. They don't care if it's a fawn or a mature buck or if it's killed with a bow or gun or what. They just want that the number they start with whittled down to another number 
and that's all they're looking at. And in fact, uh, you know, to give the the uh, listeners a little bit of history, the Illinois deer herd, you know, modern uh, hunting season basically started in the 1950s. You know, after the whitetails were were wiped out early in the century, and Illinois had a couple of pioneer biologists, uh, Forrest Loomis and uh, Jack Calhoun, were a couple of them that. Uh, Things like uh, either sex seasons actually started with those guys in Illinois. Micromanaging by counties actually started with those guys in Illinois. And, you know, they were just uh, using their own logic, but uh, they were way ahead of the game. And, and you know, uh, a lot of states copied some of the things that were started by those guys in Illinois. But, uh, you know, eventually politics, and Illinois is kind of known for dirty politics, dirty politics took over. And when the current... Uh, deer biologist was hired. He was basically a waterfowl biologist from uh, Tennessee, I believe it was. And he basically was hired because he was doing an excellent job with computer models with the waterfowl in Tennessee. And uh, so they hired him for Illinois and he came here doing the same thing. He, his whitetail, I, I'm not saying he don't have whitetail knowledge, but he was trying to use computer models not taking into account things like sex ratios and age structure as he set regulations. And, you know, at the time he took over, Illinois was at the top of the whitetail world. It was second to nobody. I mean, Iowa looked up to Illinois at that point. And sadly, you know, Illinois could be at the top of the world again with just a, a few tweaks to some regulations. But uh, the politics in Illinois just refused to let that happen. And, and Illinois is on a downhill slide. And, and the hunters in Illinois that live here are in the, that are in the know, I, they realize that there's absolutely no doubt. You know, I do, we talked about the consulting work I've, I've done, and I'm all over the state of Illinois as well as the Midwest. But in particular, I've done a lot of work in Pike County. And in my opinion, Pike County is the most overrated place on earth to hunt deer. Uh, in fact, I've got open invitations to properties on Pike County that I've done work on that, you know, I won't even go, go visit them. And I can hunt there anytime I want for nothing because uh, it's just a wreck over there. The outfitting business has come in and leased up everything, uh, you know, in the county and in the area. And just total mismanagement. They, they sold the deer herd out to make a dollar on it. And so to get back to Tim's question, Illinois does not manage for mature bucks at all. They don't care if we have one or not. Yeah, so. I think a lot of DNRs are, are like that. I mean, even Wisconsin, uh, uh, you know, I don't think they're doing a bad job, but they're trying to manage the herd itself. They don't care if they're mature whitetail bucks or if they're year and a half olds. They really don't. Right, uh, managing for quotas and numbers. And yeah, stuff, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. What, the way it is. It, what's interesting about the whitetails in, in nature, you know, as more and more people become managers of their own herd, of their own farms, I mean, that's when you really start paying the detail. You know, you're trying to grow these mature whitetails, and when you get one on your property, you're, you're proud of it, but yet you're trying to hold all those three-year-olds and, and two-year-olds on your place. And when you do that, I mean, the quantity of bucks that you harvest is a lot lower, but they're still there. So it's kind of interesting. Ten years ago, the management techniques that the DNRs were using is totally different than what they probably should be right now. You know, so it's interesting. Hey, here's a question from uh, Bob Olson. It says, what are your thoughts on direct seeding? Uh, I'm leaving a farm for my three nephews. The oldest is 10, and I was thinking of planting a stand of white oaks in a few spots and a stand of black, uh, black walnuts. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, direct seeding for, with trees, I'm assuming he's meaning with acorns for trees. Yes. Uh, I haven't had a whole lot of luck with it. I much prefer to, to start with potted trees that are you know, grown in a three-gallon pot and get some size on them and, and put them out. And I think you just, in the end, for the, the effort you put forth and the, the years you invested, I think you're a lot further ahead. Now, if I was going to do any direct seeding, there, there's a variety of ways to do it. A lot of, of uh, folks will just go out and scatter the acorns on the ground and then, then run a disc over it, you know, to kind of cover them up and disc them in. And that's a pretty poor way to do it in my opinion. I, if I was going to do it, I would go out and just plant the individual acorns and then I would take one of these plastic tree tube shelters that you know most people have seen 
and uh, stake one of those shelters right over that seed that you just planted, and then you got a chance. But, you know, the deer browse pressure is so high. There's a lot of species, like white oaks in particular, that uh, they grow so slow when they're small that the deer are browsing them off just as soon as they sprout. And there's, there's regions where there's hardly any young white oak trees because of that. Mm-hmm. You, you'd mentioned tree tubes. You know, tell everybody, you, when you first plant your first batch of trees, you, know, you look at it as a huge expense. I mean, that, anybody does it if they're not familiar with the tubes. Uh-huh. But the minute you put tubes on your trees and see the difference, I mean, it's amazing what they can do. Yeah, it really is. And we actually sell both, the, both trees and the tree tube shelters. And I tell people all the time, don't look at how many trees you can get for your money and, and, and get the maximum number of trees you can get. Look at how many tubes you can buy, and uh, that's how many seedlings you should get. Because you can go out and, and plant 100 seedlings, and two years down the road, you know, if you don't tube them, you might have two or three left. Mm-hmm. But if you plant 100 seed, or plant 50 seedlings, plant half as many, but put tubes on them, you know, you should have... 45 to 50 of them left and thriving. And those tr- tubes not only protect them from the deer to browsing them, but but uh, they actually stimulate the growth of the tree. It's like a mini greenhouse inside that tube. <coughs> and it'll cause them to grow, you know, three times faster than they would normally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I tested that firsthand. I, I planted some with tubes and without, and I even protected them. And uh, the ones that were in the tubes probably grew on average within three years, I'd say, three to five feet taller than the other trees without tubes. Wow. I mean, it's mm-hmm. pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> so, All right, Don, this is from uh, Bill Bird in Alabama, and he's asking how well do mineral blocks work, and do you have any suggestions on how to use them? Well, in my state of Illinois, you're not allowed to use minerals, so I don't know that I can answer that question. <laughs> I, I do have a small herd of captive deer, that uh, I've had for about 20 years that basically I do research and stuff, you know, I, I got them to learn about more about whitetails. And so I do give those deer mineral, and I can tell you one thing for absolute certain is calcium and phosphorus needs to be in a two to one ratio. Twice as much calcium as phosphorus. And if someone's going to, to buy mineral, don't look at the, the fancy packaging or the advertising program or what your buddy recommends or anything. Turn around that that package and read the label and look at the, the percentage of salt, but also look at the percentage of calcium and phosphorus. And, and you know, there's one, and I'm not going to mention any products by name, but there's one product that is very, very popular, a mineral product, that is like, you know, 80% salt and has no phosphorus at all. But you want to just turn that label around and look for twice as much calcium as there is phosphorus and a, and a lower quantity of salt in the mix. Yeah, oftentimes those people that are buying that mix are, are misled because salt, you know, the deer are going to crave salt in the hot weather. I mean, their body right. needs it. So if it's high in salt content, the deer are going to absolutely pound it. Unfortunately, other than you know helping the water intake, the salt is doing nothing. It's not giving them any of the, the important minerals or trace minerals that are required. So I mean that's what you really got to watch for. Exactly, and if you just want to give them salt, just go to the you know, feed store or the grocery store and just buy some rock salt to throw out. That that's basically not uh, much worse than a lot of the the products that are being marketed to deer hunters as mineral. Yeah, what's funny about that is we also have horses, which horses need salt in the summer as well. And uh-huh. in our horse pastures, we got salt blocks. And if you look when it's really hot, uh, it gets the evening, sun just uh, setting, there'll be a ton of whitetails at that salt block. So, uh, you know, they're just coming to it no matter what. Yep. Uh, here's a question that I have, and it's from uh, Dave Ziegler. He's out of PA. It says, during, a, uh, uh, during and after a storm like Sandy or any kind of major storm with flooding, high winds, uh, will the deer react the same afterwards? And how about changing the landscape with trees blown over and high water? How long does it take? Uh, how long would this take? Uh, or how long will this interfere with the rut? Well, to be honest, I've never experienced that, so I'm not sure that I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I can tell you this: we had a tornado come through uh, uh, one year in, in late. It would have been in late August, and man, if 
uh, on, a, on a deer pattern movement wise, yeah, it really changed the way they're moving because they took one 40 acre parcel that we had and made it a bee's nest. You know, it was just uh, miserable to get in and out of. And uh, what it did is it created a new bedding area from once was that something was clean turned into pretty, you know, pretty nasty bedding area. So, um, and just tell people, Don, what's your impact on a regular storm? Just, you know, high pressure, low pressure, and deer movement. Yeah, I, I go hunting anytime I can. I used to to look at the moon phase and, and the uh, solar tables and all that stuff and, and try to plan my hunts around them. And anymore, you know, I go anytime I can. I do know that cold fronts are probably the number one thing that I've seen as far as uh, increasing deer movement. So anytime there's a cold front, you know, I try to go. Uh, once we get into the late season, you, you, I watch the weather pretty, you know, religiously. And if I see a winter storm coming, I know the deer right before that storm are going to be feeding heavily. So, you know, 24, 48 hours before the a major storm's going to hit, you know, I'm spending as much time in the in the timber as possible. But, uh, you know, as far as getting really into the details, I don't that much. Yeah. You're going out just like, <laughs> I'm going to go out and bow hunt every day I possibly can. I don't care if it's drizzling outside or, or like you said, if the cold front's coming. Yeah, I might hunt in different spots based off the weather, but uh, I'm definitely going to enjoy my time in the field. Yep, that's me. <laughs> the same exact way. <laughs> time for one last question. Brian, I'm going to let you fire it out. All right, Don, this is from Gene McSherry in Wisconsin, and he's asking how much of a factor is predator control in trophy management? You know, it's interesting that I get this question because just this year, you know, I never thought coyotes bothered the deer that much, but I've had two instances this year where I've seen uh, ones here on my property. The number of deer on my property is down significantly from what it's been in past years, and especially the fawn, number of fawns, and but yet the number of coyotes has skyrocketed. I haven't went on a hunt on my property yet this year where I haven't seen coyotes and sometimes three or four at a time. And uh, I kind of attributed that to the coyotes, but I wasn't 100% sure. And then I've got another property I hunt that this summer when I was running trail cameras, the place was absolutely loaded with deer, just tracks everywhere. And I'm the only one allowed on the property, so I know there's no hunting pressure besides me. And I've only been hunting on it once, but I'm still running trail cameras. And I noticed that uh, the trail cameras kind of went dead, and the day I hunted, I didn't see a single deer, and it was, and I wasn't even seeing the tracks on the field that I had been, and uh, I wasn't sure what was going on with the property, but I knew something was up. Well, towards evening time on that, the one hunt I was there, the coyotes started popping out of the woods, and there was a, a pack of six coyotes in in that woods. So I have absolutely no doubt now that coyote population will definitely affect the, the deer on a property. And, you know, coyotes are, are just like deer. You know, they want a place that's secluded where they're not going to get harassed by humans. So so they're going to seek out the, the best cover they can find to meet their needs. And if that happens to be your deer property, well, then you need to do something about it or it's going to affect your deer hunting for sure. I, I am always amazed at how far away those whitetails can see a coyote coming or, or hear them or whatever. I mean, it's, how many times have you been out in the field and you, you see a whitetail out in front of you and... 400 yards away, it's you know it snaps its head away and it's looking towards that direction. And sure enough, there's a coyote. I mean, we're just hunting down in Missouri, and just like your farm, Don, every time I sat, I saw coyotes every single time. Wow. Uh -huh. um, the very last night of the hunt, uh, a whole pack of them came down and, and they started howling all the way around. I kept thinking of my 12-year-old son, who thinks for whatever reason they're going to attack him. I was like, man, he wouldn't come out of the tree tonight. He'd be calling my cell phone. But, um, and I never saw a whitetail that night, and I was trying to figure out, as you're sitting in the tree stand, going, God, I wonder where they are. I wonder if they're just not moving. Well, when those coyotes moved in, uh, there was no doubt in my mind those coyotes had pushed out the whitetails beforehand, and you know, I was just hunting where they were, so yep. unfortunately. I yep. appreciate your time, Don. Uh, you know, anybody that hasn't checked you out should definitely visit your website. Do you want to give everybody that website address? Sure. It's HigginsOutdoors.com. H-I-G-G-I-N-S Outdoors.com. And there is a wealth of information there, and I think you'll have links to the Real World Wildlife Seed, correct? And you probably have some information on your book as well. 
Yeah, there uh, there's a page dedicated to the the wildlife seed that'll link them right to the the wildlife seed page. I've also got a consulting uh, page about my consulting business that has a pretty interesting video on it. And uh, either one of my books can also be ordered direct, directly from the site. It amazes me how many people that think they you know they've deer hunted all their life, but you as a consultant, I mean, I'm sure you've went to many of these properties. And as soon as you get in there, you have a million ideas of what the guy should be doing on that property, correct? Yeah, and you know, each property is, is unique. And uh, it's just real interesting to travel around the Midwest. And I, I refuse to go outside of my comfort zone. I'm not going to go to the deep south or to the north woods of northern Wisconsin or anything like that. I'm, I'm sticking to the farm country of the Midwest. But still... Uh, you know, it's real interesting to meet the different individuals and see the different properties and, and see what they're doing and, and how you would change it. And, and then it's really rewarding when you get those pictures later, uh, you know, that they just shot the biggest buck of their life and they give you credit for it. So that's pretty rewarding. Nice. Well, anybody looking for any kind of whitetail information should definitely look up Don's website. I thank you for the uh, call in, and best of luck the rest of the day. Probably you're going to spend some time in a tree stand, aren't you? I'm headed that way right now. Darn it. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> is. I'm jealous. Yeah. I and, appreciate the opportunity, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. You. <laughs> you know, what good information there. I mean, here you got a guy that's not only living a dream, but he's, he's creating whitetail meccas, you know, for other people. I, yeah. I love that. Very interesting to hear about his background with the cattle farming and then how he turned that, you know, into the, the whitetail management. And he obviously has just a ton of experience on all levels of management, too, you know, from not only trophy management, but the habitat manipulation and everything. So, I mean, it's just uh, fascinating. I think we can all take lessons from Don's experience. You, you know, as a guy that has his own farm that really... You know, I was doing food plots, but I wasn't really managing the habitat till about five years ago. It is a lot of fun. I mean, you can have fun with trying to create new bedding areas. And I tell everybody, they're like, some of this you're never going to see. And they're right. I'll probably never see, yeah. you know, the fruits of all my efforts and what I've been doing. But I'm going to tell you this. My grandkids, and I don't have any right now. I hope to have them. They're going to have a whitetail mecca. I mean, it is... <laughs> It's designed, and as I'm designing it, it is to be able to harvest mature whitetails because yeah. you're creating the habitat because you know where they want to go, how they want to move, and you're creating that structure for them, but you're creating pinch points, funnels, everything else that you're going to be able to harvest them down the road when it all fulfills. So. Putting all the pieces together. Right? A absolutely. <laughs> it's going to be very, very cool. A um, couple things that I didn't get a chance to mention on the Shop Deer site. Uh, we're doing a lunar calendar package. Yeah, 40% discount on it. If you're not familiar, it's Charlie Alzheimer's rut predictions. It's going to tell you the exact when the rut's going to kick in. This is a 13 calendar. You're going to get a digital download, and I think they actually package the page a day calendar, which is a page a day gives a whitetail fact every single day. It's great if you're in the office. It's it's good information. Here's the complete uh, kit that you're going to get. It's 40% off. Great Christmas idea. Great gift idea. Um, I really like the page today. I mean, some of the unique stuff that we have in there really is, it's pretty cool. It lets you think about deer hunting all year round pretty much. Absolutely. So. And, and there's little things. And we didn't really, when we designed it and put it together, those tips aren't specific to the season. So you might get a little white, uh, you know, rut tip in the middle of summer that kind of gets you fired up. Yeah. If nothing else, it's pretty deer photos for 365 days a year. Those always work. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is uh, we have a huge book sale going on. I think it's 40% off any kind yep. of book in the store. Um, you know, so it, it is a great deal. There's a number of different books out there. We just did a new book by Tom Miranda. We did another new book on uh, with legendary whitetails that mm -hmm. you're a huge part of. Mm -hmm. Well, you're part of both books. Both That's are right, yeah. very, very good books. If you want to give anybody insight on them, go ahead. I mean, that Tom Miranda book is a, the Whitetail Slam. He's the first guy to shoot all 29 species on video. And it is a nice, nice looking book. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, uh, he was meticulous about filming all these big game hunts that he did. I mean, all 29 of the recognized North American big game species. And his still photography is also great. And it's also filled with uh, just interesting facts about each of the animals itself. I mean, so if you're not familiar with uh, a central barren ground caribou, for example, I mean, you can uh, check into Tom's book and read all about it and then see, you know, uh, his hunt for that, and also when you buy the book, link to our website uh, through a link in the book, 
and see a clip of the hunt itself. So it's a pretty neat package. Very cool. Uh, the last thing I want to mention before we sign off for the day is Destination Whitetail. It's on tonight. It's on Sportsman's Channel. Um, it was for the third quarter, which for July, August, and September, the number seven show on the network wow. is what it will play. So it's getting great reviews. Um, it's definitely a little bit different. It's more of a travel, more of a destination. It's not about the size of the whitetails. So we're not killing huge whitetails every place that we go. But it is really a unique look in the different destinations that we hunt whitetails in. Yeah. So visit that tonight. It's on at 7.30 Central Time, 8.30 uh, Eastern Time. Uh, Re-aired at like 10.30 at night. Um, again, I think you're going to like it. If you don't get a chance to tune in that, you can tune in to NBC, Deer and Deer Hunting. That's on at 7.30 in the mornings on Saturday mornings. Great show. It's been around for years, and it gives a lot of hardcore whitetail information. Till next week, I'm Brad Rooks. This is Brian Lovett. We'll see you next week. I'll be out because I'll be in Minnesota hunting and Dan will be here. <laughs> We're going to have Matt McPherson on the show, which if you guys are not familiar with Matt McPherson, he's from Matthews. He is the you know president, owner, guru, engineer, and he is going to have some great insight on their new bow, which looks very, very cool. So anyway, I'm not going to steal the thunder. The bow is out if you want to check websites, but it is a really cool little bow. Talk to you next week.